So once again, my name is Mdun Duli. I'm part of the education team at the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. Thank you for taking the time out of your day, out of your evening, out of your morning, out of your afternoon to join us in this live webinar. Uh, so at 7 p.m. South African time, I'll hand over to our executive director, Tali Nate, who will officially begin the webinar and formally introduce our speaker. But just to say a little bit about Dr. Hess. So Dr. Hess works in the academic department of the House of the Vansey Conference Memorial Site and Education Center. He is the curator of the traveling exhibition, The Vansey Conference and the Persecution and Murder of the European Jews. He's also working as a consultant, lecturer, and educator in the fields of politics, of memory, European integration, and international exchange programs. So um, his wealth of knowledge, uh, I, I look forward to hearing more and more uh, from his wealth of knowledge. We, warm, we warmly welcome any Holocaust survivors who might be joining us this evening. Welcome, thank you very much for taking the time out of your day or your evening or your morning to be with us. Thank you to all our partners, uh, our colleagues from universities and from the other centers, the other Holocaust and genocide centers in South Africa, our sister center in Cape Town, our sister center also in Durban. So thank you for joining us and your continued support and partnership. And thank you to the public for always supporting our, our webinars and all our events. And these events, our public events, our private events, our education events would not be possible without your generous support. So thank you for that. My colleague Jordan is going to post a link on in the chat uh, that will make it possible for you to, uh, the link will take you to a platform that will make it possible for you to conveniently continue supporting us at your convenience. And any donation of any amount is, is welcomed and is appreciated. So thank you very, very much for that. It really does go a long way, particularly during this time, during the lockdowns that we've been experiencing, your support has gone a very, very long way and we appreciate that very much. So thank you for that. Just to remind you that this evening's event is being recorded. So if you wish to remain anonymous, please just hide yourself. Uh, by clicking the video icon at the bottom of your screen and uh, then you'll be hidden from the world. Let me just read a few comments that people have been posting. Um, so we have Bob McCormack, who's joining us from Tulsa uh, from the United States. We have Tony Roth, who's joining us from Orange Grove. And let's see who else is joining us. We have Tadi Nates who's joining us from Johannesburg. And we have James. I hope I pronounced your surname correctly, James. James Muscat, who's joining us from Toronto, Canada. Welcome, James. And let's see who else. And uh, yes, so someone is asking if the recording will be available. Yes. So once the, the webinar is complete and the recording has been captured, it will be available on our YouTube page. So please make sure to visit our YouTube page and then the recording will be available to, to everyone. So I'm now going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to formally um, hand over to our executive director, Tali Nates, who will then formally begin the webinar and formally introduce our speaker. So over to you, Tali. Thank you so much. And uh, as people are coming in, and I know people are joining us from all around the world, and I actually saw our friend Glenn Kimmermans uh, joining from Macau. So Glenn, you are awake uh, really late, and I appreciate you joining, and I'm sure Matthias is appreciating it too. So really a warm, warm welcome to all our friends from South Africa and from all around the world um, to this evening's uh, webinar. And I know that uh, we are nearing the holidays, the, the holidays of Passover that is starting uh, this weekend. And we are nearing, of course, the holidays of Easter that is starting the following weekend. So let me wish all our friends a very happy 
uh, Passover, very happy Easter, and just safe and, and, and good holidays to, to all of us. This year marks the 80th anniversary of the Van Zee Conference. And speaking to us today, of course, is one of the experts on this topic, and that is Dr. Matthias Haas, a long, uh, a long time friend of the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center, who visited South Africa in 2018 and gave many, many lectures around the country. And uh, he also curated uh, an exhibition about, um, about the conference that also toured uh, around the country and, and, and was at our center for, for, for many months in 2018 and 2019. Um, tonight's webinar is in partnership with the Memorial and Educational Site House of the Van Zee Conference. And we are very, very happy to be able to partner with, with the house on this conference. Let me introduce Matthias formally to you. Dr. Matthias Haas is the acting head of the education department and the deputy director of the Memorial and Education Site House of the Van Zee Conference. He's the curator of the traveling exhibition I mentioned that traveled around South Africa called the Van Zee Conference and the Persecution and Murder of the European Jews. Excellent exhibition, which I recommend and, and I'm sure that we will put it up again uh, soon. I will recommend for you to explore. Uh, Matthias has worked as a consultant, lecturer, and educator in the fields of politics of memory, European integration, and international exchange programs. And um, he worked with uh, many organizations, including UNESCO and the Federal Association for Civics, Civic Education. He was the director of the US Program of Action Reconciliation Service for Peace in Philadelphia from 2005 to 2009 and studied political science at the Free University of Berlin and specialized in the field of historical foundations of politics and the politics of memory. He also taught uh, at the uh, Free University of Berlin or Fry University of Berlin, uh, also in York University in Toronto and Turo College in Berlin. Uh, he worked in several museums and memorial sites uh, to the Nazi past and published numerous uh, articles um, in many publications. So it is really an honor to have Matthias speaking to us in this year's anniversary. And uh, as my colleague do mention, please do write your comments, your thoughts, your questions, as always in uh, the chat box, and we will discuss it all after the presentation. And now it is a great honor to pass the microphone Zoom to you, Matthias. So the floor is yours. Thank you uh, for those kind words, Tally. And I will just um, share my screen right away that you don't have to see me. Um, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It's a tremendous pleasure and an honor for me to be here with you today. And thank you to the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center for inviting me to this webinar, to this lecture. And as I would like to especially thank uh, Telly Nates. Um, and really our cooperation goes back a few years when Telly and her colleagues brought a group of students to Berlin to the house of the Wannsee Conference. And I think that was one of the remarkable, most remarkable teaching and learning experiments for me, my colleague and me. We had hardly ever met a group that was so eager to learn, but also so eager to discuss the opportunities and challenging challenges in comparing historic events. And as much as these students were open to learn the history uh, of the Holocaust, they asked us about our knowledge and interest in South African history. Um, and a year and a half later, uh, Tally gave me the opportunity to learn this history firsthand when she invited me to South Africa for the 80th anniversary of the November pogroms in November 2018. So I had the opportunity to visit all three South African Holocaust centers and also to get at least a very small insight into South African society today. 
And today we continue our cooperation and this time in a different format, unfortunately, not live. I would have loved to come again to Johannesburg, of course, but I'm very glad that we are able to meet at least in a digital format. And we will, uh, and I think I'm allowed to say that, continue our cooperation in the next months. We have invited Tally also to present the concept of the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center to us. I think a concept that combines the history of the Holocaust with the history of the Rwandan genocide. And for us, that is a very courageous concept and I'm sure we will learn quite a lot. In Germany, many memorials are located at historic sites. That's where history had happened. They usually focus on the stories of the victims, the prisoners of concentration camps, for example, and many more. And also in the process of learning and teaching about the Nazi past um, and the Holocaust, we also focus on this perspective of the victims and in a way that is always at the core of our work. And the ed and education about the history of the Holocaust has always an element of remembrance and memory in it. There's more to it though. And the institution I come from has a different focus. And now, my PowerPoint works. Um, I work at the House of the Wannsee Conference uh, Memorial Site and Education Center, the historic site where the Wannsee Conference was held. So our focus on this history is through the perpetrators and their actions. We do many educational programs with a variety of professional groups from police and the military to nurses in training and apprentices of chemistry and of course school classes. We work with five federal ministries and raise questions about professional ethics in history, but also today. All of our groups work on the history of their profession during National Socialism and the relevance of this history for them in their fields of work today. And they all, of course, address the Wannsee Conference as a key event in the process of the persecution and murder of the European Jews. I will talk today about the Wannsee Conference in its larger historical context, but I will also address its relevance in the wake of ri rising anti-Semitism in Germany and Europe today. And to be very honest with you, a few years ago, I would not have thought that the kind of open anti-Semitism and conspiracy narratives, often with Jews at their center, that we are facing today still exists. But it was a painful learning experience, um, which also raised a lot of new questions for our work. And because of that, it might be helpful not only to speak about the Wannsee Conference and the deportation of the Jews from Europe that led to mass murder, but also about anti-Semitism prior to that. So let us go back briefly to the end of World War I and the assumed reasons for having lost the wars in Germany. And what we see here is a postcard from that time. And uh, we see here the German soldiers in the trenches of World War I. Uh, Germans think about it. And we see here a classical figure, a social democrat with a knife in his hand, the stab in the back. Um, undefeated in the field. That's the myth of um, the, the German army. And uh, it's, it's defeated by the home front. And who is the home front? That's the capitalists here. And we see here the bankers, the money, and we see clearly the Jewish caricature of um, the stereotypical image of, of Jewish financiers. We see the, the media here, we see these newspapers lying around there. So they are the ones um, that make Germany lose the war. And in the end, and in the back, we see the masses, the leftists, the communists um, that, that were part of that. But so that myth um, existed from, from the beginning uh, on after the loss of World War I. It is the Jews who were targeted and of course, and uh, we all know that this became more and more the tool for the Nazis to reach out to all social groups in society. Jews are capitalists, Wall Street is Jewish and that helps to reach out to the political left. And of course, communism is Jewish, Bolshevism and Moscow 
are Jewish. And that, that helped to reach out to the conservative nationalist political right. So it didn't begin just in 33, but the Nazis used that tool of anti-Semitic propaganda and ideology that resonated in German society from the beginning on. The first groups that were targeted after the Nazis are in power are political opponents, mainly from the left, socialists, communists, unionists, and in the end, everybody else who de defended the democratic system. But already on April 1st, 1933, the Nazis organized the first boycott of Jewish shops. And we see a photo of that here, uh, Germans defend yourself from Jewish atrocity propaganda. And we have to be very clear, this is a propaganda tool also of the Nazis. This is, we see them, the, 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 the stormtroopers here with their uniforms in front of the store, Germans defend themselves, you see the German sign, but you also see it is already translated in, into English. They help the international media. If the, the New York Times, for example, wants to publish this, we have an, already uh, the translation of their propaganda. Um, and I think that is, we have to be very uh, clear that this was also used for propaganda. The Nazis didn't want to have this, this um, boycott of shops in, in secretly or so. It was well known and anti-Semitism is widespread in society and it's shown open. And for the, the bystanders, the, the, the civilians walking by, we see this older man here. That's not scary. The woman is in a, in a chat with one of these uniformed men. So we have that clearly see how ingrained it is uh, in society. We see that also here, uh, photographs of a, of a group of Hitler youth uh, with their group leader and Jews are not welcome in the town of Beringersdorf. And that is from the early 1930s. And we can imagine these, these young boys are influenced by this propaganda. They grew up with it. Uh, their parents already had it, probably not as harsh, um, but um, eight years later, these boys might be soldiers occupying Europe and maybe, and we, we have examples of that, of course, participating in the persecution uh, against, uh, of Jews, the murder atrocities against Jews. Interestingly, I think these measures were not always a top-down procedure from the government to society. This is, for example, maybe uh, this sign was put up by uh, the party group of that town or the mayor. Um, sometimes developments began in society and had consequences at a policy level. And we see that here. That's a photograph from the city of Norden in uh, Germany in the summer of 1935. And, and that timing is important there. Um, we see here a Jewish man and his non-Jewish partner. Um, and, and they are walked through the town and he has to wear a sign, I'm a race defiler. They are in a love relationship, uh, non-Jewish uh, woman and a Jewish man, and there's nothing illegal about it in the summer of 1935. Uh, but the common sense of the time of the majority of German society is that this is not right. This is against the Volksgemeinschaft. This is against um, what people know and how to behave and who to engage with. And um, so we have the police patrolling, controlling the situation, but we have bystanders. This is excitement, something is going on. There is a, we have the teenagers, the kids that wanna be here in the photos. And for the couple, it is a humiliating situation. And we have, a, it's a whole series of photographs and, and really the mob doesn't have enough, enough um, uh, in the streets of, of that. And they, they get another woman who is involved with a Jewish man. They don't get the man and she's walked through the street. So we have that even though the Nuremberg race laws have not been passed. And that is the response um, of the government that in September, 1935, in the summer of 35, it's a wave of anti-Semitism going through Germany, violent, uh, openly violent and brutal against Jews. And then as a response, the Nazis passed the Nuremberg race laws, and it has to be defined who is Jewish. And in the process, the question of definition is quite important. Every German had to prove their German-blooded background. Two 
uh, four, four grandparents are of German blood and you're German. And we ha always have to say that in, in our educational programs as well. I mean, and we are aware of that. There is no German blood, okay? We, it doesn't exist, but it's the law. It, it's made the law. And if you have four Jewish grandparents, you're Jewish. If you have three Jew Jew Jewish grandparents, you're Jewish as well. And then we have the question of uh, Mischlinge Erstengarde, so half Jews with two Jewish and non-Jewish grandparents, uh, or one uh, uh, Mischling Zweitengarde, as we have one Jewish grandparents only. Um, and there is a connection to the Wanze Conference, of course, because through the definition, uh, measures become operationable. There are hundreds of laws and orders and decrees against Jews, but only now it is clear to whom we have to apply them and can apply them. And in the protocol of the Wanze Conference, the last four and a half pages deal with the issues of half Jews or one quarter Jews, Jews married to non-Jews, with children or without. Should they all be deported or not? And in the end, the issue was not solved. There are complications. And that is the, the tiny detail where there is discussion, which also shows us there was discussion. And they were not all scared of Heydrich. And I come to that later. In November 1938, 10 months before the beginning of World War II, we have a new level of violence with the pogrom night, the night of broken glass, Kristallnacht, um, where we have violence, exclusion, and in a way, I think we can say that we see here the end of German Jewry of almost 200 years. And maybe you've seen this photograph, but I think it's interesting to have a closer look at that. Um, this is a photo from November 10th in the morning in the city of Baden-Baden. Again, a series of, I think, eight photographs or 10. The, a group of Jewish men are marched from the headquarter of the police to the synagogue of the city of Baden-Baden. And who do we see here? We see clearly in the middle these men, Jewish men, middle-aged, as we see here, middle class, very clear, well-dressed, middle-aged, um, marched. So we have the victims here, marched by the police and the SS troops, the perpetrators, we clearly see them. We see a few men on the sides here also. See somebody here with a hat. Um, we see other men and walking on the sides with, with hats. That is probably Gestapo in civilian clothes. And then we have bystanders. We have the bystanders coming to this march through the town. We see bikes here on the side. People probably brought their bikes and oh, something is going on. We see these people here with their caps and their white clothes, masons or bakers that uh, take a break and let's see what's going on. We see on this wall here uh, on the right hand side, somebody is taking a photograph. So and we look through the lens of a photographer. So we have perpetrators, we have bystanders very clearly. And a little sign of humiliation that we don't see is, but it's, it's or we see it, is these men do not wear hats. And as, as a German man at the time, if you leave the house, you wear a hat. That's one of the insignia of, of the bourgeoisie, of the middle class. And no, no, you are not part of us any longer. There's one of these photographs prior to that, where one of these men in the front still wears his hat. And then the next shot, no, you're not allowed. Here, these men, they all wear hats, or many of them, most of them wear their hats. And it's a small sign of humiliation. You do not belong any longer. You're not part of, of us. Um, these men are marched to the synagogue, are forced in their head to read from Mein Kampf. Um, and then the synagogue, after they left, is set on fire. And they are arrested and brought to the concentration camp of Dachau. 30,000 men uh, are, as a result of the November pogrom, are brought to the concentration camps of Dachau, Sachsenhausen, and Buchenwald. So we clearly see them visible to all. Um, and, and we do not know what these bystanders, what these people think. We, we do not know if they want to document it or if they approve of it. And we have to can ask ourselves what's necessary kind of behavior under the conditions of a dictatorship is being silent enough, but that's not the topic for today. Um, on September 1st, 1939, World War II begins and with it, not only a war for territory, but also for the racial new order of Europe. And the main target in this war are the Jews. 
With the invasion of the Soviet Union on June 22nd, 1941, the systematic murder of Jews begin. Men, women, and children are murdered by the Einsatzgruppen, the mobile killing squads of police and SS. And by the end of 1941, more than 500,000 people were already murdered. And this is the setting where the Wannsee Conference is held. On January 20th, 1942, a meeting took place at Lake Wannsee in Berlin. There was only one topic on the agenda of this work meeting with breakfast afterwards, as it was called in the invitation and which lasted around 90 minutes only, the final solution of the Jewish question in Europe. How to organize the deportation and murder of 11 million European Jews. Reinhard Heydrich, who we see here, the head of the Reich Security Main Office invited 15 officials from the police, the SS, the administration of the occupied territories in Eastern Europe, the party chancellery and various ministries. Heydrich was authorized by a directive signed by Hermann Göring on July 31st, 1941, a good half year earlier, to carry out all material and logistical measures concerning the final solution of the Jewish question. His aim at these, uh, the meeting was to highlight his leading role in the organization of the genocide, to secure the cooperation of the participants, and to make everybody aware of what final solution meant, mass murder. Heydrich initially planned, the, uh, uh, initially planned conference date was December 9th, 1941, and that had to be changed following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. Germany declared war on the United States on December 12th, and with that really world, the world war began. Before that, we had a conflict in Southeast Asia and a conflict in Europe. Let's have a look at the situation of, in Europe at that time. We see in the middle here the German Reich, Germany, the dark, darker blue, and then the light blue, the occupied territories of Europe, from France to Norway, from Greece to the outskirts of Moscow. The continent is conquered by Nazi Germany. We have fascist Italy being an ally, and then we have these lighter countries, Hungary, Slovakia, Romania, Bulgaria, Croatia, semi-independent right-wing authoritarian regimes that um, are working with the Nazi regime. It's not as, as harsh often, but if they do not behave accordingly, they will be conquered as well as we know in the case of Hungary in the spring of 1944. So what we see here, yeah, the battle over Britain, it seems a matter of time. I mean, that's, that's the understanding in Germany. We, Germany, are winning the war. Whatever we do, and the plan is the racial new order of Europe, why can't we do that? Because we are winning. And that's a mentality that these men bring to this meeting. It's not about finding compromise, peaceful solutions, it's about winning and losing. The eternal battle of races has come to an end point and we are winning and we are creating a new world. And one of our tools is mass murder and the main target, the main enemy, by far not the only one, but main and first are the European Jews. The decision to murder all the Jews in Europe was probably made during this period. And historians are still debating the concrete date when the decision was made, and there is no key document signed by Hitler that gives evidence, as we have, for example, for the euthanasia killings, the murder of people with disabilities. But we have evidence through a series of meetings and speeches that mid-December 41 was probably the time when Hitler, in coordination with Himmler and others, made the decision to murder all European Jews. Let's have a closer look. Um, at the meeting, we see here uh, the people who were at the meeting. We see here on the uh, on the left hand side Reinhard Heydrich, um, and Heydrich brings his staff, the head of the Gestapo, uh, Heinrich Müller. He brings his expert to Jewish affairs, Adolf Eichmann, to police commanders. I will come back to them, and the other people he invites are colleagues. They are not on the political level of the regime. They are the, what we call Staatssekretäre, the permanent secretaries in the ministries. 
the ones who are competent and the ones really who run the show, who know how to run an administration, um, who is going to cooperate with whom on which level. And these are the people uh, that he invites and he cannot give orders to them. He has his staff, but he can cordially invite them and can cordially uh, talk to them. Um, we have, as we said, the, the police and Gestapo, but let's not make no mistake. We see Wilhelm Stuckart here from the Ministry of Interior and we see him here in his SS uniforms. Many of them have and double ranks in the civilian administration, but also as members of the party and members uh, of the SS. What do they have in common? Well, their average age is 42 years old. That's pretty young for the ranks they have. Um, with the exception of two, they come from middle-class families. We have 11 Protestants, three Catholics, and one who follows this new sort of system of beliefs, Gottgläubig. He's a God, believer in God, um, so a Nazi religion. We have nine Prussians. We have two from Saxony, one from Bavaria, from, one from Austria. We have seven who had fought in World War I. And we have eight who belong to the so-called war youth generation, too young to fight in World War I, but influenced and grew up and their political thinking influenced by this loss. And they wanted to make Germany great again. Um, and that's how uh, they started working often in the 1920s already. 10 of the 15 went to universities. Eight of them had been awarded doctorates. And of course, that was much easier at the time, but, but still, I mean, they have an academic career. Eight had studied law. Some joined the party early on as old fighters, some in 1931, 32, but some only um, after the ban of membership was lifted in 1937. Nine were members of the SS. Some were members of the Reichstag, Freisler, Heydrich, and Meyer. Um, so what we see is that they are pretty average. They are very young, they are well-educated, and they are convinced of the Nazi ideology. But other than that, they have, there's nothing special about them. They are ordinary Germans. Until a year, a year and a half ago or so, th that was it. That, these were the people who were at the meeting. But we know, and we knew for a long time, but never really worked with that, there was somebody else at the meeting, somebody who's taking notes the stenotypist, who was she? It was a secretary. And, and, and there was always an understanding that Eichmann who wrote the protocol didn't take the notes. And for a long time, it didn't seem interesting. Um, now a colleague uh, went into, did some research um, and, and found out there was the secretary. And I, I think it is interesting. And it gives us an insight to the fact that this was in the internal procedure not something completely different, this meeting. It was part of the daily work routine. And a, a secret meeting, it was a secret meeting, but that was not so unusual. And so it was normal that a secretary is taking notes. It was the work routine notes are necessary. And so um, there were names of secretaries of the time. And um, now uh, through some research and, and cross-checking, we are pretty sure that we have a name, Ingeborg Werlemann, a young woman of 23 years, um, worked for Eichmann, was a the his, his first secretary he worked with. Um, and she was probably the one who was at this meeting. She was never, she was uh, interrogated after the war about things, but never really questioned about that. She passed away 2010. That's not that long ago. And so we still had not that long ago people who could have been interviewed, but uh, who do we ask? Where do we look for as historians if we look for sources? Secretaries didn't seem to be that interesting. Now, um, after we have now talked who was there, let's, let's um, have a look at the protocol himself. Eichmann, responsible for Jewish affairs within the Reich Security Main Office, wrote in coordination with Heydrich the protocol, and he used coded language to summarize the results of the discussion. The extermination plans are only outlined. So we have 15 pages of protocol, and we see here the first page, who is attending. 
we see here we have 30 copies. This is number 16. That's the only surviving copy of the protocol of the mi minutes of the meeting. It's a secret uh, Reich matter and protocol of the conference. Who is attending? A page and a half. Who's there? And then we have Heidrich giving in uh, a longer uh, overview what happened so far. And then we have on page five, I think the first really important in our context and the because of time uh, part. As a further possible solution and with the appropriate prior authorization by the Führer, emigration has now been replaced by evacuation of the Jews to the East. However, these operations should be regarded only as a provisional option, though in view of the coming final solution of the Jewish questions, they are already supplying practical experience of vital importance. So that's what we have. That's a typical example of the language. What, what do they mean um, by practical experience? Why can we assume they mean violence and murder? Let's have a look, and I mentioned that, to, uh, at two of the men, the police commanders who were at this meeting, Eberhard Schöngart and Dr. Rudolf Lange. And this is a photo of Rudolf Lange. Rudolf Lange is stationed in Latvia and he's the commander of the security police in Latvia. He's stationed in the city of Riga. A day earlier, on the 19th of January, he's still in Riga. On that day, a train arrives, 1,000 Jews coming from Terezin via Berlin to Riga. They are unloaded, walk to trucks, uploaded on trucks with these trucks that leave the city, go to the forest. They are unloaded, marched into the woods often have to dig their own graves and are murdered one by one. 1,000 people by the troops of Rudolf Lange. He is the commander of this mass killing. He goes on a plane, he comes to Berlin, and we have to be clear, with bloody hands. I mean, a day after this mass killing. And those are the practical experience of vital importance that these men probably are talking about. Why are they there? Why are Lange and Schoengart there? And they talk about probably issues that went along with this killing. And that's for them in their minds, efficiency issues, money, a bullet per person, a, a time. And I mentioned just the procedure for after arrival, what to do with the bodies. And one, one criteria of, of genocide really is you get rid of the evidence it ne and, and claim the perpetrators claim at the end, it had never happened. And, and well, we have, and I mentioned that early until 1941 already, more than 500,000 men, women, children being murdered. That's some of these practical experiences of vital importance. We have other experiences. We have the first murder with Cyclone B in the concentration camp of Auschwitz in, Berg, um, in, in September 1941. And we have the euthanasia killings. We have the killings of people with disabilities. And we have already now, we know how to murder people in an as the Nazis want to do it orderly way, how to do that. Um, it's, we have war, we have violence, we have massacre, but this is different. This is now with a bureaucratic procedure um, involved. And that is the killing with carbon monoxide in these hospitals and nursing homes serves as the role model. The personnel is later off and transferred to Sobibor, Bergetz and Treblinka in, Eastern, in occupied Eastern Europe to run the death camps there. Let's have another closer look at the protocol. On page seven, it continues. In the course of the final solution and under appropriate direction, the Jews are to be utilized for work in the East in a suitable manner. In large labor columns and separated by sexes, Jews capable of working will be dispatched to these regions to build roads. And in the process, a large number of them will undoubtedly drop out by way of natural reduction. Page eight continues, those who ultimately should possibly get by will have to be given suitable treatment because they unquestionably represent the most resistant segments and therefore constitute a natural elite that if allowed to let go free would turn into a germ cell of renewed Jewish revival. Brackets witness the experience of history. <clears throat> So again, we have um, uh, people will drop out by way of natural reduction. We work them to death. They will be worked 
the work will be exploited until people die. The program of extermination through labor of the concentration camps is, can, we, we can see that here. Um, and then we have those who will survive that will have to be given suitable treatment. And there's only one way to understand that and to read this. And this is, they will be murdered. They will have to be killed because otherwise uh, they will organize resistance. That's all they need. The whole protocol does not have a single word of shooting, of gassing, of murdering people. All they need is coded language and they're all in agreement and, and they're all aware of what this, this means. And, and, and you can talk about bureaucracies and, and administration, how they usually distance themselves through language and, and here in the most extreme way, I think. And let's have one more look, um, one of the key pages of the protocol, page six, and that is the statistics. That's what the Nazis, what Eichmann gathers before the meeting and forces the Jewish communities in Germany and in the occupied territories to deliver the data. How many Jews do we have? Category A, here the countries are uh, under our control. The Alt-Right, that's Germany, the Ostmark, Austria, and so on. Category B, the countries where we have to send either our diplomats, Bulgaria on this uh, map that we saw has an independent government or England where we have to win the war. The plan is at the end to murder 11 million Jews. And as um, we, we, again, we can question that and can look at the numbers and this is statistics the Nazis put together, the bureaucrats, there are mistakes in there. Uh, there are errors in there. And still, I mean, for them here, we have only a statistical, a mathematical administrative uh, problem. Bulgaria, we have to send our diplomats and ask the Bulgarian government to hand over their Jews. Um, and Bulgarian government says, well, uh, these are our citizens. We can't hand over the, our citizens. You can't have the non-Bulgarian Jews living in Bulgaria. And so they are brought to Auschwitz and murdered. But, but then there are diplomatic uh, relations, legal issues. The Germans say, oh, why, why don't you pass a law that we have passed in Germany as well? You just bring them to the border. And by leaving the border, if you pass that law, they lose citizenship. So they are not Bulgarians any longer. And at that time in history, the Bulgarian government does not agree to that. And so for the Bulgarian Jews in Bulgaria, most of them are safe. But for the Nazis here in, in this statistics, it is a, it's problem solving for their issues the final solution of the Jewish question of Europe. So it is quite clear from the protocol what the final solution was. It was the planned murder, deportations first of 11 million Jews of Europe. And coming back to the three goals that Heydrich had, one, securing his leading role, two, asking for cooperation from the attending ministries and organizations, and three, making everybody aware of what final solution meant, he had reached two, of them quite easily. His authority was backed by the letter of Göring and he made everybody aware what final solution uh, meant in case people were unaware and that is highly uh, unlikely. The third goal was a little more difficult, asking for a cooperation for a program of mass murder. How it was phrased in the invitation and during the meeting was Parallelisierung der Linienführung, parallelizing of the procedure. In order to have one procedure for the Europe-wide deportations to the death camps in occupied Eastern Europe, Heydrich needed cooperation. And that is the result of the Wannsee Conference. Everybody was willing to cooperate. Nobody hesitated and looked for a way to not participate in the genocide. And they could not have done that openly, probably, but they could have played this system. We are overworked, we are understaffed, et cetera, et cetera. Nobody did that. They all just looked at their field of work and if that was affected they got involved but if it was not they were all happy to be part of this um and if we have look at two people here mr neumann from the plenipotentiary for the four-year plan industrial planning he only gets involved in the protocol once and when they talk about his he's talking about his his the, the jewish slave laborers uh, working uh, in the war industries and he said, look, before they cannot be replaced by others, you cannot deport them. That's his own concern. He has to go have the war industry going. And then Heidrich says, no, 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 before they will be replaced. And then we go step by step. 
and the minister uh, from the Foreign Office, Mr. Lutter, the Under Secretary of State, he comes with an own list of wishes and desires by the Foreign Office to be involved. They want to be part of that. It's part of authority of, of power. And of, of course, bureaucratic language helps. Not once the protocol talked about gassing, about shootings, about murder. It's described in different terms, but it is clear uh, what it meant. And we also can assume from post-war testimony that the participants at the meeting were quite explicit in the way they talked about it. They talked about murdering, wiping out, et cetera. So here at Wannsee, the murder of the European Jews was not decided, but it was coordinated by leading bureaucrats, how it was going to be implemented and carried out. The Europe-wide Europe deportations were a central part of it. The perpetrators who gathered in Wannsee joined their Nazi convictions rooted in racial anti-Semitism with a sober and objective understanding of their bureaucratic profession to create an effective plan for the genocide of the European Jews. The Wannsee Conference signifies the willingness of German state offices to cooperate in the Holocaust. The conference participants became accessories to and perpetrators of the genocide with several agencies and hundreds of thousands of civil servants and police participating in its execution. What we see here are the most extreme crimes of the Nazis, crimes against humanity, genocide. And I just mentioned that the convictions of the perpetrator, perpetrators rooted in racial anti-Semitism. But what is interesting is that we know little about the concrete forms of the anti-Semitism of these participants at the meeting at Wannsee. At this point in time, there is no need to talk any longer about that. It is at the core of everything they do. The Jews are the enemy. The Jews have to disappear is so clear to them, they do not need to bring this up. And this clarity of hatred against Jews did not come up suddenly, surprisingly, but it uh, grew over time and was deeply ingrained in the minds of these men and in the minds of millions of ordinary Germans. And it was deeply embedded in the policies of the German state and often at the core of it on all levels of government and state bureaucracy. The levels of anti-Semitism in the 1920s and 1930s are not unimportant because in comparison to the atrocities that were committed after 1939, they were not as horrific. They are important to understand that the persecution did not start suddenly in 1939 or 40, 41, whatever, but they developed over time and there were signs that things were utterly wrong. And that is why it is important to look, out, look at our world today. Don't look for the big horrific crime. Let us look at the smaller events and the smaller crimes. And that is, I think, why current forms of anti-Semitism and conspiracy narratives are so troubling. And I would like to give you a few examples. We see here the door of the synagogue of the city of Halle. On October 19th, 2019, it was Yom Kippur, a neo-Nazi attacked the synagogue in Halle where 51 congregants had gathered. He shot at the synagogue door and tried to get in, but did not manage to get into the synagogue and instead killed two people, a woman who was walking by and a man in a nearby fast food stand. The perpetrator streamed his attack live on the internet and during the attack, he denied the Holocaust claimed feminism to, led to lower birth rates leading to mass immigration and he blames the Jew to be res the responsible for these issues. And this is one of the most violent examples of right-wing extremism, but what is striking is the mixture of ideological elements in his Weltanschauung, and at the center of this is the hatred of Jews. Another example, or another few examples, during demonstrations against anti-corona measures of the government, some people feared that there will be mandatory uh, vaccinations by the government. And because they opposed this, they marked themselves with a yellow star in the inscription Impfgegner or Ungeimpft, vaccination op uh, opponent or not vaccinated. 
And very clearly here is just minimizing historical events, putting themselves in uh, the role of the victims. And we have, I mean, the anti-Semitic cliches uh, all over. Uh, we have people who are targeted, George Soros, uh, one of the main people uh, who is seeing, trying to, to run the world. Uh, is Soros with, with his uh, philanthropic activities. And uh, the Jewish world conspiracy reference is, is, I think, pretty obvious here. And there are other very strange and disturbing comparisons. A young woman um, in Kassel, Jana, 22 years old, compared herself to Sophie Scholl, the resistance fighter of the White Rose, the young woman who was executed. And she compared herself to Sophie Schall at a demonstration against anti-corona measures and saw herself in the resistance because she took part in democratic procedures, distributing leaflets, going on a demonstration, engaging in debates. So it's obvious that something is going on here. Current events are directly linked to the Nazi past and anti-Semitism is at the ideological center of many of these issues, no matter how constructed, absurd, and crazy the arguments are. There is obviously no direct link from Jana and Anover to the men who met at Lake Wannsee in Berlin. But the context of the meeting on January 20th, 1942 in Berlin are the years before, leading up to deportation and mass murder. The poisonous language of the 1920s and 1930s, the widespread anti-Semitism, the small and not so small actions against Jews, bureaucratic and openly violent, led to a common understanding of Jews as the enemy. And at a certain point, there was no need any longer to argue why the Jews are the enemy. The common understanding on all levels of society that the Jews were the enemy, that they had to disappear, was deeply rooted. And when asked to participate, only few opposed and refused to do so. Words matter, the public discourse matter, and the few who start spreading hatred and lies need the bystanders and the enablers who remain silent for their hatred and lies to grow. If nobody speaks out, their ideology can spread and conspiracy narratives gain ground. To engage in public debate, to call out the liars and ideologues cannot start early enough, and it's not enough to call them fools and laugh at their nonsense. As we see in our world, there is a risk that the nonsense and with it hatred, division and violence become powerful forces in our societies. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Matthias. As always, you are absolutely excellent in the so much to think about. So um, as we are opening the floor and uh, if people want to either ask a question or uh, put in the chat. Let me be the first to, to ask you, and uh, I have two questions, but let me start with the one. Um, we are, of course, in South Africa, and we know that Nazi Germany controlled also parts of North Africa. Uh, it, uh, through Vichy, it controlled uh, West Africa and other parts of Africa. There were concentration camps, in fact, in North Africa and um, even in Vichy, a Vichy concentration camp in places like Niger and Senegal and so on. Uh, it struck me that Eichmann's list is European countries only. Uh, and uh, even though there were communities of Jews in places like Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, and so on, um, they are not mentioned. If you can speak a little bit about that and from your information about the perpetrator side, not only Vanze, of course, was Africa ever discussed by the perpetrators for the final solution? Um, this is right at the core of something we are debating right now um, within our work and dealing also with the protocol. And the protocol, I think, has um, some details there. Um, as you said, and the, 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 the topic is the final solution of the Jewish question in Europe, period. They talk about Europe. Now, the question is, do they include maybe in the statistic numbers of North African Jews? And the numbers of France, for example, um, are wrong. 
we do have, I think, over 700,000 uh, Jews. And even if we take the, the occupied part and the uh, Vichy France, those numbers do not add up. So one assumption is, and I have a colleague, an historian, who says, look, I, um, um, I think uh, they mean also the, the Jews in the French colonies. I do not agree. <laughs> it's a debate that's going on. And I think, and, and Dan Mishman, the Israeli historian has, has argued that this is probably a mistake. And um, there is debate, do they include that? I, I would make a few, few points why I think they do not think about um, Africa. They do not include that. They focus right now of winning a war in Europe. And at the end, probably they want to conquer the world. They want to rule the world. They have are at war with the United States already. But it's anti-Semitism. But it's also a racist um, ideology. It's a racist. I mean, it, deeply racist. We conquer the world, and with this imperial view, and the European countries had conquered Africa and Asia and South America and exploited those. We deal with that later. We don't need to deal with them now. Do they really uh, leave them out? No, I don't think. I think in the plannings all together, and we have camps in Tunisia, and we have that. At Vanzi, their focus is Europe. That does not mean that, that, that again, on the ground, the people who, the Nazis who are in uh, the different places in Africa and see the Jewish communities think, oh, oh yeah, we need to stay uh, take action here as well. So. It's a yes and no. I don't think that at Vanzi, they talked about North Africa. I do not think they include them. I, I find the mistake argument from Mishman convincing and it's hard to believe that these Nazis made mistakes. I think exactly that helps us understanding, of course, statistics are always wrong. I mean, can be. So, but, but eventually and in the minds of the people on the ground in the places, probably they took already actions. That, that, that included Jews there, that had them um, uh, uh, into slave labor, they have slave labor units that they have, and people are worked to death there. So we do have crimes and killings, not in the intensity as we see in Poland and the Soviet Union, but nonetheless, um, part of the crimes. I hope that. Thank you. Th yeah, gives. absolutely. Thank you. And it's, it's, it's really interesting. And always so interesting how many new research topics there are and how many more we need to actually learn about this subject. So um, actually, as, as I see in the chat, uh, uh, G. Home is saying excellent uh, presentation and uh, he's happy you pointed out the Vanze uh, conference did not decide on the Holocaust, but merely confirmed it in a way. And alre already they were up to a million victims, of course, uh, in 1941 and, and even before that. So uh, he's recommending for everyone when we can travel to visit, of course, uh, the museum. Yeah. Um, Luke Albinski has a few questions. Maybe let's start with one. What evidence do we have for Hitler and Goering's instructions relating to the final solutions? Is it correct that only the euthanasia program, as you mentioned, has Hitler actual, you know, uh, signature and the, were, the rest was verbal or is there anything in writing? In, starting with the with the euthanasia killings, we there we do have uh, the killing uh, order signed by Hitler that people who are incurably ill can, upon a most careful diagnosis of, of their condition, be as they call it, granted a mercy death. I mean, so Gnadentod that was the term they used, and that is so again coded language for the killings in uh, the nursing homes and hospitals. The whole action T four. We do not have that for the murder of the European Jews, but we do not have on a lot of levels a written orders by Hitler. He governed often in that way. And if we look at the Nazi state and the, how it was governed, um, that is a tool um, to, to keep the levels below uh, sort of competing. We have governmental bureaucracies and we have party organizations, often with the same duties. Now, what does Hitler want? We have to interpret the meaning of the words of the Führer. And that is whoever makes a suggestion or goes the way where Hitler says, yeah, that's it, sort of wins power. And in, in a way, this becomes a more, more, more radicalizing uh, system. And in the persecution of the Jews, for example, this is more the one who comes up more efficient, 
radical ways of killing people, um, we have that. But we do have some evidence that we know from uh, a meeting between Himmler and Hitler um, uh, in uh, early, mid-December. And for a long time, that was not known. But in the Moscow archives, I think about 20, a good 20 years ago, uh, uh, historians found uh, the schedule of Himmler of that meeting. And, and there, uh, there's a scribbling of Himmler that says, Jews to be exterminated as partisans. So we have the plan there written down, how to deal with the Jews, treat them as partisans, and that means exterminate, kill them uh, as partisans. So that's one evidence. We have a, a speech um, by Hans Frank in the general government, the occupied part of Poland, um, in the second half of December, where he says, look, we have a huge problem here. We are overcrowded and health issues. But in Berlin, they already come up with a plan how to deal with this issue, and soon that will be solved. And there is a clear evidence. We have a speech that uh, Hitler gives in front, in front of Gauleiter, uh, the, the di regional district leaders, where, and, and that word spreads, where they come up with a plan and they will get rid of the problem. And that is where most historians believe today that um, de mid-December is the moment when it was decided. It was not decided earlier, probably. And we take it, the deportations from Germany begin in October 41. And one, and, and they go to the ghettos, the people are put into the ghettos and are not murdered. The German Jews are not murdered. To make room for them, the Polish and the Russian and the uh, Jews are murdered. But then the ghettos are relatively empty. The German Jews arrive there. There's no killing order. There's one train arriving in Riga, uh, not too long, but the, not, not a commander. Um, who, well, the ghetto is not empty, what am I going to do? And he kills those 1,000, roughly 1,000 German Jews. And he gets in serious trouble at the end of November because that killing order to kill the German Jews was not given. And it's a hierarchy of, of following orders. And, and with all the anti-Semitism, with all the plans eventually, at that time, the German Jews are seen as more civilian, uh, civilized, aren't they? I mean, they are not these Slavic subhumans and Jewish. They are different. And I mean, and and their way, that way of thinking is is crazy. But but we have evidence that so the, on the nineteenth of January, what Lange does in Riga, the killing, he doesn't get in trouble. That's ordered. There is a change between the end of November and the end of January. So I and I that's so from that evidence, um, I think we can see. Um, that the order was given. The planning of the camps of Belgets, which is then underway already, had begun also earlier. So there are things underway on all levels, but that decision I think was made then. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because Helmno, of course, is starting to operate already on the 7th of December of 41. And, and as um, mm -hmm. uh, someone said, I mean, mass murder starting immediately after Barbarossa. So you have, uh, mass killing so it's, it's it's sort of bottom up and top down killing is killing. is the way to go mass shooting is the way but now they have the europe wide all jews of europe or all, all jews of the world eventually but will be killed and and that differentiation between western europe germany and eastern europe is still it is made there but then parallelizing of the procedure, to have the same procedure from Norway to France, to Germany, the Netherlands, Greece, um, how to do that, when is which train going with how many people to which of the camps. Uh, we don't want to have two trains arrive at once. We don't want to have um, sort of a week, no train. I mean, this is logistical efforts and that's what they coordinate there. Absolutely. Uh, James Muscat is asking, is there also a rise of antisemitism in Germany through social media? If you can speak a little bit about the <laughs> role of social media. Um, is there a rise uh, of anti-Semitism? I don't know, because uh, I think it was always there, but people were anti-Semitic and people were sitting in their apartments, were in the streets without social media 25 years ago and had no um, sort of uh, references or no, no exchange to others. And, and the internet and social media, of course, helps to, to get in contact with others, to get to connect and to spread your ideology and your 
uh, ideas. And then you, you might hate the Jews in the 80s and early 90s, but there is no, nobody to talk to. Now you do have them. And then it's getting probably, whoa, yes, don't you agree? Yes, and, and even worse, and it's becoming more radical. Um, so probably there is sort of, it's getting faster, it's getting um, more uh, heated up, I think. People support each other in their ideologies. That's what we see. Why do they stream their crimes, um, anti-Semitic, but also racist crimes? Because they want to have followers. I think that's what we see on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the social uh, media and the internet altogether. So I think um, it's coming out more openly. It's getting probably uh, more violent, more radical, definitely. Um, back to the Van Zay conference, Carolyn is, is asking, I mean, it is crazy that the meeting took just 90 minutes. And in 90 minutes, all these, you know, uh, negotiation decisions happened. Um, how much planning before that was done, she's asking, that a meeting took such a short time? So, so maybe talk about behind the scenes of the planning of the meeting. No, look, how, how are meetings planned today? I mean, how is an administration working? And for them, I mean, yes, the immensity of them, they must have been clear also what they're doing there is something extraordinary. This is something really um, they have, haven't done so often. But the nature of the meeting is something, uh, it's sort of their daily planning. We plan a meeting, high ranking, 15 permanent secretaries. That's, that's pretty big. Um, but then you have some planning, okay. Um, and Heidrich wants to dominate this meeting. That's probably why he chose a place outside of Berlin where he can show off, it's highly representative. It's a great, it's a great place. So he serves food, he serves drinks, it's a loose atmosphere. He has an agenda and he prepares for that agenda. Um, and he has Eichmann to prepare the statistics already for the meeting in early December, for December 9th. The statistic is at hand, it's there. We have Estonia in that statistic. I mean, it's up to date. Estonia is free of Jews, Judenfrei already. The Jews of Estonia have been murdered. So it's up to date. Yes, there is planning, there's an agenda. The foreign office is invited and they, oh, it's postponed and they have sort of letters being sent from A to B and who's going, please coordinate, please report back. And the foreign office has a wish list, a list of wishes and desires. I think it's three pages. Um, we wanna get involved in the countries where we have our diplomats in Bulgaria and Hungary and Slovakia and so on. And they get involved and where we have, uh, uh, wherever their interest is affected. And so the, even on that level, there is some plan. There is the planning to bring Schöngart and Lange to Berlin. Um, so that is, I think, quite a little, uh, a, a lot of planning uh, in detail on the side of Heidrich and his staff. Um, probably, I mean, and, and already in, in the planning, who is not there? The Ministry of Propaganda is invited and doesn't show up. But the military, for example, the generals, I mean, the military is participating, the Wehrmacht is participating in the crimes. But the interest of Heidrich says, I want to be in charge of that. Uh, has to do, I have to leave the military out because it's happening in parts in, in a zone, in a, in a territory where the military leadership, the generals have the say, they are in power. And he, and, and a year earlier, Heydrich had lost uh, an initiative where he wanted to be in charge. And then it was, yeah, well, yes, no, yes. No, he's not. The military took over the Wehrmacht. So there's competition. So that they are not there, uh, I think is planning. The Ministry for the Trains, the Train Ministry, Bahn, Reichsbahn Ministry is not there. That's already been dealt with. Um, how do we pay for the trains? We need, we need trains. I mean, the train, yes, we can provide the trains and we, you have to rent them and you have to pay a price. And because you get um, people, uh, passengers under 14 and over 65 get a reduced rate and you get group rates one way. All of that is planned, adv advanced. And, and so there is a lot planning and then follow up, of course. Yeah, and, and a lot of it can be seen when you visit the museum, you know, like uh, you deport a Jew who will pay the electricity bill that will, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you can't kill a Jew and who will pay the bill, you know, so all those things are absolutely amazing. There are lots of uh, fantastic questions, maybe uh, we'll take a few more before we close. 
uh, Bob uh, is asking, are you familiar with the film Conspiracy uh, from 2001? How do you view this historical uh, accuracy, lack of accuracy? Should we use it? Shouldn't we use it as teachers? Ah. Um, there, I think right now, two movies are out. There is a, doc, uh, is a film from 19, I think, 82, 83 from Germany, a German production, and then uh, there's Conspiracy. Um, in the filming of Conspiracy, I think there was some negotiations if we as the House of the Wanzer Conference cooperate with this, our partners, and at the end, the House, and I wasn't there at the time, backed out and said, no, no, this is not as accurate as we want it to be. Look, it's, it's a movie. A movie is, uh, as I always say, has a, a good, a bad, and an ugly one. We have excitement. We need to be it. There needed to be interesting. We need to have a good uh, sort of some arguments, and and there are a lot of mistakes in that film. I think so. But that's the nature of a movie. Um, uh, this uh, meeting was probably, and we don't know exactly, but from the protocol, in my understanding, is, was probably uh, dominated by Heydrich. A lot of talking by Heydrich. A lot of influencing more than we even see in conspiracy. Um, it might have been even boring at times and long. And, and, and so these movies uh, are, wrong, are wrong. And still, I think there is a value to them. I think there's a good value in, in showing what they are as a source. This is a movie for entertainment with an historic background, with a uh, serious topic. And let's use them as that. And, and let's make, we use them in the classroom, make students think about it, but put it in context, have a critical analysis of that. I don't think, I mean, students are not stupid. If we, we teach it and approach it and give it enough time, I think there is a lot to be learned from these movies, a lot of thinking about how it could have been. I mean, the imagination of, um, of students, I think, is, is important to see, to get an idea of, of, of historic scenario if we just let, let them read boring bureaucratic documents nobody will be interested in, in history as much as we want and i think so there is a good value in that but we have to be very critical of it and one last sentence there is a new film being just filmed um that will come out to the 80th anniversary next january um from a german film company with one of the public tv stations and we were advising them and looking with them and are in close contact. And we are very curious to see the result. And if that fits more our image, how a film should look like, but we don't know yet. We, we are waiting with anticipation. <laughs> yep. Is the museum upgraded, uh, the, the upgrade finished by the way? I know that when I was there last, uh, it was uh, quite a lot of work. Yes, the, we have a new exhibition that opened uh, last uh, January, was open for about six weeks, and then the lockdown came and never reopened really. Um, it is focusing more on the Wanze Conference as an event itself, and it's so it's um, it should be more accessible and uh, in the design for all, as we call that. So there is, for people with disabilities, some tools and guidance uh, through it, um, and it should be we, we wanted to reach out to more people that maybe have no not so much knowledge knowledge but we also didn't want to lose any any of our visitors who have an interest and have been there and know a little more so please come I to hope Berlin. to visit I hope to visit one day soon um, maybe two last um, comments questions uh, that I got um, uh, in a direct message. The one you spoke about the antisemitism of before to explain the um, as, as a prelude. And one of the things that you spoke about was the Mischlinge, you know, and the who is a Jew, who is a full Jew, who is a quarter Jew, and so on. Um, and, and that was discussed in Vanze. Um, the question is, um, was the same systems used in all occupied countries in Europe or uh, this was for German or Austrian or Reich Jews only. And uh, can you talk a little bit about what was decided in Van Zee about uh, the Michelin, Michelin uh, question? Mm -hmm. um, look, look, the Germans have occupied Poland and uh, have occupied the Soviet Union for Lebensraum im Osten, so the living space in the East. They are whole racist attitudes towards Poles to be enslaved. I mean, the murder of the Polish intelligentsia, they, in a way, couldn't care less if, and, and if there were any doubts, they'd rather probably murder people. So they were not as strict. 
but also the history of the Polish Jews and the German Jews and the other Jewish communities um, throughout Europe is quite, um, it's quite different. I mean, the whole development of German Jewry as being part of German society, being integrated, being, being, um, being Germans. Um, I think um, that is different than, for example, in Poland, where the levels of integration were not as high, where we still have many Städtel, uh, the Jewish villages, the towns, or we are, we we um, have so have a so different social fabric of the Jewish communities, and therefore it was not as difficult for uh, the the Nazis for the Germans to to find the Jews living in Poland. But then you have um, not the legal um, 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 framework, but you had, for example, the same search methods. I mean, you go to the church books, you go to uh, wherever you have so the, the communal districts where people had to sign for passports and where you sign up at your religion and, and then they, they found them. Um, and, and there, I think it was not as uh, strict as it was in um, as it was in Germany and Austria. And, and in Western Europe, again, you have uh, differences. You have um, differences fr from the different countries in the different um, um, levels of occupation and resistance and collaboration of the administrations there um, to, to be part of that. Usually, and I think that is important, they were much harsher and there was not a legal system that you pass the law, but you have, the, have martial law. And with that martial law, you and before you establish your own, you can do whatever you want. And and bef before you establish your civilian administration, it takes some time. And I think with the uh, the special orders, um, it was much easier. Um, the whole the deportation trains, the, the the cargo cars that we know, for example, were not used in Germany. They had third class passenger cars because you, they left from a regular train station. So you have a very different behavior um, on that, on, on all levels. So it's in different regions, um, how you were able to use the different populations, um, were they anti-Semitic and wanted to get rid of the Jews or not? So, and, and that, that also added up to their, to the behavior. So it not, it's not never one fits all. So what do you do? In, in Wannsee, you have the question of the half Jews and one, Heydrich has the plan to deport them all. He said, look, um, and, and if you read the protocol, and I've read it many times, I've studied it, and I could not, I mean, I could not tell you that with this and that, and it's, it's really bizarre. But that what Mr. Stuckart from the Ministry of Interior says, look, this is complicated on the level of administration. Uh, this is too much too complicated and it will lead to unrest in the majority population. You have a, a Jewish man married to a non-Jewish uh, woman and now you deport the Jewish husband. Now they have children, so these children lose their father. They are, um, so that is already a, a problem. People in mixed marriages, you, you, you take that full Jew and deport that person. Then that, that family, and, and they have to choose not, even if you deport the children, the mother, and their social environment says, look, we hate the Jews, but they should have left our friends with us. So there is that component. And I think the security service um, of the SS, the Meldung aus dem Reich, uh, of the SD, uh, the reports from the Reich, they try to get an impression of the feeling, the atmosphere in society. And they were very cautious about that. Yeah, we are winning, you're winning, but when does the, the atmosphere maybe uh, change? We are not sure. And that might lead to unrest, it's complicated. Uh, so there was within the debate, um, uh, uh, within the meeting, some debate, and that's what people do. I mean, I'm not a historian, I'm a political scientist. And so what do politicians do if they do not come up with a conclusion and a decision? They postpone, and that's what they did. Oh, we don't need to discuss this for Poland, so Mr. Bühler from the general government has to be present. Eichmann invites to a follow-up meeting on March 6, 1942. Six weeks later is the next meeting to discuss that matter. And again, they do not come to a conclusion. They do not come to something operationable for them. So most of the Jews in mixed marriages, half Jews, are saved. In the first transports, on the communal level, when the lists are put together, deportation, we have some communal anti-Semites who put have, have Jews in, the, in their definition uh, on these lists, and they are brought to Minsk or Kovno. 
And then we have people around them, no, 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 you reported the wrong person. Please bring him back. Nobody's brought back. I mean, if you've seen those conditions in the ghettos, sorry, too bad, shouldn't have happened, but can't do anything about it. So we, again, we have the realities different than the, the paper form. Wow, so complex and, and, and so so interesting, actually, the whole issue of, uh, of, of um, the detail and the arguments in between them. Lots of comments, lots of thank yous. Uh, some people even thinking about links to South Africa during apartheid, coded language, uh, and so on. So interesting, interesting uh, reflections and connections uh, in, in the, in the uh, chat. And um, maybe before we let you go, uh, the last question is from Luke about the growing extremism and um, nationalism, uh, populism. Uh, is that also, you know, part of the problem of growing anti-Semitism? Uh, and I know in Germany with AFD, and maybe you want to speak a little bit about your own sort of backyard. Um, yes, I think that is connected. I think the whole populism and um, uh, the populist right that, that entered the scene, I think there is a mix of of racism, of anti-Semitism, of xenophobia on all levels. And, and, and they are not the same. And I mean, they are very specific in, in, in each case. Um, but of course, uh, again, if, if we look at the, now they are in parliament and I think the, uh, in the last years, really they, and, and being in parliament, you have a voice and you have support and, and you have money and Germany, you, you then better fund it. And so that is, is something, but, if we look at the 50s and 60s and 70s, it was never uh, uh, not there. I mean, we have in 1968, the NPD, the really the old Nazi, neo-Nazi party was very close in, in entering the federal parliament. They were on state levels in parliaments. We had them always there. Um, we have these voices of, of populists, of right-wing extremists, and we have on the, on the, extreme conservative side of the political spectrum. Um, we had voices in the 90s, oh, there were budget cuts or we, we, we did, small towns were almost bankrupt um, and then said, oh, we have to kill a rich Jew to pay our debts. And then, oh, okay, so, oh, well, that was a bit much. And then somebody had to resign, uh, a politician from the CDU. So we, I mean, we, do, we had that before, we had the scandals before. It's nothing, nothing, um, uh, nothing new. Um, so, so on that level, but I think it's, it's become a, a, a hotter topic. Uh, we, we, we have that and we have, a, have an interesting um, uh, mixture also with, uh, of course, um, other uh, groups and we have Islamic uh, anti-Semitism. And I mean, and then and, and the populists hate the, the refugees and they have, hate, of course, I mean, this, the, the counterparts of Islamists, but of course they brought often ideologies and, 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 and narratives and conspiracy narratives against Jews when they came to Germany. And, and so that is a challenge. And that's a mix, uh, uh, I think, um, a, a difficult mix. And in Germany, that problem is not as, as bad as it is, for example, in France. And if we look at Europe, we have in France, of course, and we have the killing of, of Holocaust survivors by Islamists. I mean, we have these, these incidents, we have the murder of, of, uh, in, in, in supermarkets of Jews and the attacking of Jews, of people visible. And, and, and that is coming from um, also Islamic uh, Islamists, um, so from extremists there. In Germany, the situation is, I think, by far the right-wing anti-Semitism by what we call bio-Germans, sort of biological Germans, so the, the original Germans is by far the, the, the largest, um, I think. But, but it's sort of, it's complex. And um, even though the AfD says very clearly, no, 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 we are not anti-Semitic and we're very pro-Israel, very pro-Israel. The reality is, and that, that is what we see if we look at the situation in Hungary, also anti-Semitism and the anti um, uh propaganda, um, I think that that is the way to defend themselves because that is in, in the public discourse so far, if you're marked or if, if you are an anti-Semite, that's, that's uh, negative. That's, that's still be seen as very negative. I think that is very clear. That, I mean, the examples of before that are, are huge. Yeah. 
Yeah, and you shared with us some and um, yeah, some of the examples also during the pandemic that were, of course, very yeah. troubling, very troubling. And, <laughs> and I mean, if you would have told me really years ago, I said, come on, I, yes, things are bad, but come on, there are no cra not crazies out there. They are, and, and they don't seem to be crazy, but I think that that is, I mean, the deeply rooted anti-Semitism there is just um, mind-boggling. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And hopefully your lovely daughter, Ella, will be our future of sane society that comes uh, to, to, <laughs> to, to understanding human beings rather than uh, to, um, you know, to, to, to have conspiracy theories, hate, hate and uh, dangerous speech against each other. That's all we can hope for. But Matthias, really, thank you so very much for sharing with us some of your thoughts, uh, the presentation, and, and answering uh, difficult questions and, and challenging questions. Uh, really, we do appreciate it very much. And, uh, and we appreciate the partnership with the, with the house, uh, with the House of Banzai Conference, and uh, uh, looking very much forward to, to continue with it and uh, uh, for many, many years to come. And again, to all our friends uh, that are uh, observing uh, 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 Passover or Easter, we, we wish you all very, very happy holidays. We say Chag Sameach for those observing Passover and very uh, meaningful holidays for, for Easter. And we will see you again after uh, and next week, actually, uh, for our next uh, presentation on the 31st of March at uh, 7 o'clock, partnership with the Durban Holocaust and Genocide Center. And it is about uh, the book, uh, The People uh, on the Beach with Rosie Whitehouse. So good night, good day, lovely to have you. Thank you again, again Matthias. Thank All you for having me. It was a pleasure. And yes, we will uh, continue our cooperation. And I'm very much looking forward to that. And thank you to all of the audience who I couldn't see, but thank you for participating. <laughs> thank you very much. Be safe and all the best. Bye-bye. Uh -huh.